All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Arlington Committee of 100 program, Virus and Vaccine, What's the Way Forward in Arlington? So we have record registration for this program tonight. I realize that means you are especially eager to hear from our panelists and to have your questions answered. My name is Hannah Dannenfelser, and I'm the chair of the Arlington Committee of 100, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. Some of you are watching us on Facebook, and if you think this is something that your friends would like to hear, please consider sharing the Facebook Live with your friends. It will also, uh, the, the feed of, your, of the Facebook page will have this recorded at the end of the program if you'd like to share at the end. To stay in touch with us, please like and follow our Facebook page. We publish our events through email announcements as well as Facebook events so that you'll hear about our upcoming programs and can share them with friends who might be interested as well. So we are getting close to a full year of being in lockdown, but with your support, the Arlington Committee of 100 has been resilient throughout this past year. We were one of the first organizations to pivot to a virtual environment without skipping a beat and our first Zoom program was titled Arlington in Action, Responding to COVID-19. Dr. Ruben Varghese is bookending the pandemic year for us because he served on that panel back in April and he's here with us again tonight. When we wrap up this program tonight, I'm actually gonna be going to the Arlington Committee of 100 website to rewatch last year's program because I'd like to reflect on what this past year looked like and see what we were talking about at the very beginning. Over this past year, Arlington residents have been more tuned in than ever to local current events, and we've had our highest attendance, that's what we'll call this attendance, in recent memory over the last 11 months. Last time Dr. Berghese was here, we broke the record, and when we close out tonight, we will have broken the record again. So Dr. Berghese is our lucky charm in terms of the attendance, so thank you for that. And Nancy has just come in and uh, is helping us break the record again. We've multiplied the number of people who are in our network by more than five times and local news outlets have covered us all, have covered almost all, if not all of our programs over the past year. So I wanna give a special thank you to ARL Now, the Sun Gazette and Inside Nova and the Falls Church News Press who have helped us spread the word about critical timely issues over the past year. If you were wondering this time last year, most of us barely knew about the coronavirus and the Arlington Committee of 100 was talking about kids vaping in Arlington over dinner in Phelan Hall at Marymount University. It's hard for me to even recall back to that when everything just feels like the before and the after of last March. I'm really looking forward to the day when I can see many of you in person again and we can have our programs. Uh, certainly, they'll certainly look different and I'm excited to see what the future looks like. Before we get started, I do want to tell you about our program for next month. How has the pandemic impacted student learning and well-being? I know the news is rapidly developing about school reopening, and next month we'll be featuring panelists to talk to us about the impacts COVID has had on students and how Arlington Public Schools will be addressing the student recovery. If you check that chat box at the bottom, if you're in Zoom, check the chat box. And we just pushed out a registration link to you for Wednesday, March 10th at 7 p.m. So I encourage you to go ahead and mark your calendar and sign up for that. That is also going to be a really timely and critical program. We do wanna give a thank you to our sponsor, the Arlington Community Federal Credit Union. They came in to be our program sponsor for this throughout this year. Many of you who've been with us for a while know that we pivoted to foregoing our membership dues in lieu of a sponsorship from ACFCU. So it's been a great partnership in helping us get out timely educational information to local residents. So tonight we're featuring Dr. Ruben Verghese, Arlington County's Public Health Director. I've heard him repeatedly referred to as our local Dr. Fauci. He's been leading the public health efforts this year, and you may have seen him present in county board meetings, forums, and more. After Dr. Verghese, we'll hear from Nancy White. She is the executive director of the Arlington Free Clinic and the co-chair of the Complete Vaccination Committee. I've actually had the pleasure of working with Nancy and her free clinic staff quite a number of times, and they're doing really fantastic work for uninsured Arlingtonians. I know in particular, I'm really looking forward to getting back to their gala one day. It's one of the best events of the year. 
Nancy is helping lead the Complete Vaccination Committee, which is a volunteer group established by the county manager that increases awareness of the COVID-19 vaccine. So we have our two panelists who will be presenting to give you some updates, and then we're going to go to the Q&A. I know many of you have already submitted questions with your registration, and I am seeing the numbers pop up on the Q&A box that you're submitting them right now as well. So those of us, those of you on Zoom, take a look at your screen that it will demonstrate how you submit questions. You're probably Zoom pros by now that you know how, but you see Q&A at the bottom, you can just type in. We're going to get to as many questions as possible. I will tell you, I have many, many questions already. I'm doing my best. I'm going to do my best to consolidate them and get to the ones that, um, in particular, the ones that are being asked repeatedly. So we'll get to as many questions as possible, but we are restricted by the time. So um, I think we're going to cover a lot of ground over this hour. For those of you submitting questions, I do encourage you to keep them very concise and in the form of a question. Again, we just do have a high volume of questions, so it'll be a lot easier for us to get to your question if it's in the form of the question and very and it's written very concisely. All right, that is all for me. You'll I'll be back for the Q&A later, but for now I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Dr. Ruben Berghese. And you are on mute, Dr. Verghese. I keep forgetting that. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for the opportunity to come and to the Committee of 100 for the invitation. Um, I'm hoping next year you will not have me bookending uh, another time for a pandemic because it would be nice if that was over. But um, that's a goal. And I'm going to share slides because I want to make sure that we get to um, your questions uh, as soon as possible. So. I am hoping people are seeing a graphic that says 12,150 new cases of COVID-19 in Arlington residents. This is the weekly counts through uh, February 6th uh, or week five of the, the year. I always start, if I, possible, with trying to remind people where we are in this pandemic. So on the x-axis are the months of the year and uh, our first case started, uh, we identified cases in March of 2020, and we're now through uh, the first week in February. And I can't believe I'm saying this. This was uh, where I think you're seeing my cursor go, I hope, uh, back in April and May. That was when we were thinking the pandemic was at its worst when we were first experiencing it. And I, I, it's, it's, sad to think that this was what we were thinking was a lot and then yet since that time um, while it got better under a number of the governor's executive orders as the number of people were allowed to actually start congregating and um, uh, gathering again uh, up to 250 uh, people potentially gathering we started seeing over the summer and especially after uh, october a steady rise in cases and <clears throat> we uh peaked at the beginning of January. One of the things I want to make sure people are aware of is you may see three um, columns of gray, and that's really a reminder uh, of how data on, on the coronavirus, as well as any other data like TB or so on with communicable diseases, there's always a delay in the uh, reporting of test results from laboratories or doctor's offices. Um, we can wring our hands that it happens, but this has been happening for decades. The point, though, is that the numbers that you see here do not necessarily mean that that's where they're going to be in one, two, and three weeks' time. So uh, <clears throat> while I, it looks like there may be a little bit of a downturn, I want to look, up, be very cautious uh, and make sure that people remember, um, even if there is a downturn, we still have a lot of COVID around. So it is actually with that in mind um, that I make this next uh, uh, part of the presentation. Please continue with a layered approach to protect yourself and others from COVID-19. So vaccines are an important tool and now a reality in reducing your risk for COVID-19 infection. However, obviously we know that it's in limited supply, but even if it weren't, Vaccines are an additional layer to add to what we continue to recommend you do daily to protect yourself, your loved ones, and our community from COVID-19 spread. 
So you will still need to practice these prevention steps after vaccination, staying home as much as possible and definitely stay home if sick, keep physical distances uh, equal to or greater than six feet from others outside of your home bubble. Even at your workplace, I am so happy so many uh, work settings people consider each other to be families. But what my caveat is, if you do not live with the individuals in your workplace, please keep your distance because that is the way that you can best prevent spread. Also wear a face covering when you're within six feet of others outside of your home bubble. And as a reminder, the CDC definition uh, for a close contact has still not changed. It's for those who are six feet, within six feet of a person with COVID-19 for 15 minutes or more cumulatively. If that happens, we still recommend uh, quarantine um, at those moments. And we're trying to reduce the, the number of those moments happening in any of your lives. <clears throat> so moving on more to vaccine and eligibility and so on, I am using this um, table to help people understand what the federal government has done to uh, jumpstart the process of getting more vaccines. So this was what they went through last year. The Operation Warp Speed, they had five companies that they contracted with and said, look, we want you to do the regular processes of clinical trials, fancy term for doing studies in uh, human beings, uh, those who get vaccinated in the placebo group, do what, follow the FDA recommendations on what they need to see. If you get through the FDA emergency use authorization uh, system, we will pay and assure you uh, payment for the vaccine so that you can actually make them simultaneously as you're actually studying them. So what they did was basically guarantee production simultaneously uh, along the same time as the uh, studies were being done. But to make sure everyone is comfortable, not one of those doses are supposed to be released until the FDA approves it. And if the FDA, for whatever reason, doesn't approve it, the government will make good on allowing the manufacturers not to lose any money, but those doses will not come out. And one of the things that people need to see is, while the numbers are impressive, how many doses secured by the US government, uh, if you add up all of these numbers, there's uh, well over uh, enough for at least 400 million uh, Americans, and we don't have that large a population. But the problem is only two have actually, to this point, made it through the FDA emergency use authorization protocol, the Pfizer and Moderna. And looking at when those products are supposed to be available to the US, they weren't assured at the beginning of January. In fact, Pfizer and Moderna both were supposed to deliver vaccine during the first quarter of this year. So it doesn't surprise me that there aren't as many doses out there if they're producing it and sending it to us, to us as well as other countries. And even though they, we bought additional doses, they're coming in the second quarter. Um, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which is the only one that's one dose, they just submitted their application for the EUA process, I believe last week. And what we're hearing is the FDA will be considering them for their final approval um, the week of February 23rd. So, but that means all of these doses are still not available. And even if they are, as far as I know, they're not guaranteed the first day that the EUA is authorized. So just to try to keep people as, um, expectations uh, met, you know, in, in check with reality. Dr. Berkey, my apologies. Would you mind, would you be open to expanding your screen a little bit? Um, someone was just mentioning it's a little hard to see. Okay, I'm going to see if I can do something. Is it the size or um, let me see if I can actually then put it on. Um... I'm so sorry to interrupt. Thank That's you okay. very much. Okay. I really appreciate yeah. it. Okay, and uh, I can share the slides uh, as Perfect. well. This so, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the general uh, perspective on how CDC and, and the Virginia Department of Health have been approaching um, the allocation of uh, limited resources. And uh, Virginia, uh, the governor has accepted this sort of general framework. And while it's not exactly what's on their website, I wanted to make sure that uh, people understood the general principles as well of, of vaccine. So, 
With limited supplies, uh, the National Academy of Sciences first proposed uh, a tiered system and then CDC and its advisory committee for immunization practices adopted uh, roughly the same with some modifications. And then VDH made some modifications as well that were uh, also accepted by the governor. Uh, some of it was, uh, as people saw interest, they made some changes. So the basic principles have been the same. There are those who are at increased risk for complications should they get the virus. Everyone is at risk for a complication, but some groups are at more risk than others. Uh, typically that risk increases as everyone gets older. So if you're an 18 year old versus being a 28 year old versus being a 38 year old, you see the 10 year increments I'm using as example, the risk for complications, especially serious illness and death increase. The other risk is being at increased risk for exposure. So while you may not necessarily be at increased complications, those professions or those jobs that put you at increased risk for exposure then put you at risk for possibly more complications and spreading it to other people. So that's roughly how they were thinking about allocating scarce resources. Phase 1A, they asked, they recommended long-term care residents, those in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities be prioritized because those individuals are in those facilities because they cannot attend to their own activities of daily living typically without some degree of help with someone coming within six feet of their uh, body or their person. And so therefore it puts them at more risk uh, for exposure to the virus, especially if the staff member brings it to the person. Once the resident has it, the risk is also in, uh, to the staff member. Also, healthcare workers as a general class are more at risk because they're more likely to see people who are sick before anyone else in the population. And so hospitals, uh, their staff, people in nursing homes, people in doctor's offices are prioritized. Then the next group was supposed to be in phase 1B. Originally, the at-risk population were 75 years and older. And also uh, on the exposure side, uh, they had specific uh, groups and Virginia specified them. And each of the semicolons here is actually important because this is literally the order that uh, the governor accepted as a recommendation of how to prioritize among workers in any jurisdiction. So the at-risk populations are Arlington residents, the Exposure risk for the essential workers are for those who are working in Arlington in those capacities, and we get those lists from the employers. The areas that are shaded are they're done on purpose because I wanted to make sure you realize originally when Virginia adopted these, these groups in the shaded areas actually were in 1C. So 75 years and older, just in Arlington, was roughly uh, 10,000 people uh, based on the census in 2018. It's actually 9808 roughly. When you add in the 65 plus, that's an additional 15,000 individuals that qualify based on census. And then the 18 to 64 year old population without chronic medical conditions by itself is a, a group of 169,000 people. Now, when you take the national data about what percentage of people are considered to have chronic medical conditions, it's estimated to be about 50%. So on the worst case scenario, that would mean individuals who are 18 to 64 in Arlington with chronic medical conditions would be a, a number around 85,000 people. Now, given that we are routinely considered to be a healthier population in Virginia than most, I don't believe we're going to be as high as 85,000. But remember, we don't have a national database or local database that specifically tells us those things. So for planning purposes, we just put that out there, letting people understand. Suddenly, 1B went from on one side of dealing with roughly 10,000 people to potentially 100 to 110,000 people, uh, maybe off, maybe about 120,000. And then obviously on the other side, we've got also continuity of government staffing, which also is at issue. That used to be in 1C and that can actually add to the numbers. So you can see while there's a certain number of vaccine, it becomes more difficult. And one of the things I wanted to make sure people um, are aware of, and this is my last slide, uh, 
Virginia right now is getting about 105,000 doses of vaccine every week. That's for the entire Commonwealth to cover 8 million people. So they went from a system where they gave it to healthcare systems, which don't necessarily res respect geographic boundaries. It's not a criticism, just they thought initially they were gonna do it through healthcare systems and the health districts. But when the supply did not come as quickly as everyone thought it would, they shifted to a per capita system. And so when you take 105,000 doses, our proportionate share roughly about with a population of 200,000 people, we're only guaranteed 2,750 doses per week. Small number, but we are trying to be as efficient as possible to get the doses out. And this is something that is on the county website. For the first doses received to date, we've been able to put 10,184 doses out of 11,425, reaching 89% uh, getting into arms. And the only reason why it's low this week is we did include in this number towards the end of last week, we got doses of first dose vaccine that was meant for this week. And so we're being that transparent. So it makes it look worse. If you remove that 800 doses, we would have been at the 95.85%, which is I think pretty good for what we're trying to achieve. So um, with that, I am going to uh, end my part of the presentation and turn it back to you, Hannah. Thank you very much, Dr. Berkeys. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Nancy White. Again, Nancy is the Executive Director of the Arlington Free Clinic. She is also the co-chair of the Complete Vaccination Committee. Um, Dr. Berkeys, if you wouldn't mind unsharing your slides there. And then I, I got him, I got him. Perfect, I think, All right. I think we're good. Can you see that okay? Uh, yes, would you mind expanding your slides? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. So hi, everybody. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Dr. Bergis and everybody who's pulled this together. And um, to all of you who are here tonight, uh, it's hard to think of, of really good silver linings about the pandemic, but I don't know about you. I was glad to not have to get out and drive to Marymount tonight in the um, icy cold night. So um, it's good to be somewhere warm and talking um, among friends. So I'm looking forward to, to your questions um, as well later. I'm going to talk briefly about three things. One is uh, briefly about the uh, about Arlington's complete vaccination committee, and then second, I'm going to talk just a bit about Arlington's safety net and just the experience I'm seeing from uh, reaching out to those individuals um, from my role um, at Arlington Free Clinic, and then finally, what you can do and how you can act um, right now. So. Um, if you need to hide some of your um, screens to, in order to see this, you can, uh, I think, can do that, but um, hopefully this will be good. And as, as Ruben said, we are happy to share our slides. Um, so the Complete Vaccination Committee is an extension of what uh, was successful this past year uh, that was called the Complete Census Committee. That was the work that was you know, very successful to get all of the enrollment and participation in the census. And so uh, this has continued with that. And I'm happy to be a co-chair along with Wanda Pierce, Elisa um, Ortiz, and then also the board liaisons, Katie Crystal from the county board and Barbara Cannonan from the um, school board. We also are being joined by um, the members that you see listed there who are individuals who many of whom were involved with the census committee, but who have extensive networks in different um, areas of the community so that they can help us spread the word. And then in addition to these individuals, we are in the process of developing partners for the CVC and those are organizations, churches, civic organizations, businesses, you know, coffee shops, you name it. And we have 60 at this point and just started added, adding partners. Um, so there, and you'll see a link on there, which I'll share again later on how your organization might be able to um, also be a partner. But the purposes of this committee, you know, initially before we all learned about um, how significant the shortages were, that a lot of the role of this committee was initially to build confidence in the vaccine process and encouraging individuals to get the vaccine. So it was really gonna be, you know, support this, this is the right thing to do, you know, sharing our story, those sorts of things. But I think the reality right now is that, that our most important role is providing accurate, 
up-to-date information on what is going on, what the processes are for registering, pre-registering, how to share that information about timelines and all, because as, as Dr. Vergis was saying earlier, things are changing almost hourly, I was, was, would say daily, but it's even sometimes more often than that, and it's changing quickly. And so it's really important, um, you know, as you all know, there's so much information flying around us to make sure that, that we have a network of individuals and organizations that will help share this information really accurately. Um, and we'd also, uh, at the same time, serve as sort of ears to the ground for the county so that we can share what we're hearing. We can share information that, you know, when there are confusions on what the processes are um, and all of, of those things or suggestions. And so we're, the, that uh, communication goes both ways. And we also are joined by really talented staff throughout Arlington County, um, you know, certainly County Manager Mark Schwartz, but Bryna Helfer and her team um, have been very involved in this as they were with the Census Committee. So this is a, a sort of a horizontal version of the slide that, that Ruben shared earlier. And this slide as well as the next slide are available on the county website. And it's, uh, it's easy to find, I'll share the link, but also if you just put into a browser, Arlington, Virginia, COVID vaccine, and this will pop up and you can see this, but this shows you in a list who is being scheduled now. So who can register now in the green, in the orange is who can pre-register now. And then in the gray, not yet eligible for, um, for pre-registration. So those individuals will come later and those groups will come later. And so it's a very clear chart that if you're in the orange, doesn't mean that you're gonna get a vaccine tomorrow, but you can put your name in so that you'll be contacted when the time comes. And so um, if you know individuals or if you are one of those individuals that is in the green, then you can go ahead and register uh, to begin uh, you know, reaching out to get your, your vaccine scheduled. There's also a, a set of tabs below. And if you ask, how do you pre-register or how do you register? This is that tab, you click on that first square in the upper left corner, and that will take you to the site to be able to register for the vaccine. There also on the website is a um, 228 number, 2287999, I believe, but it um, allows individuals who need help with um, internet or help with you know, an unusual language that they speak or with literacy that they can call and get help specifically to help with pre-registration. And so that information is, is also on the site. This also has lots of FAQs as well as additional information and, and some of the dashboards that, that are available. So just a quick little glance from my world uh, and the safety net. And these are not, um, I don't believe they're super up-to-date slides in terms of the data. It's basically just the visual impression that I think we need to, to think about in terms of the vulnerable populations in our community. The first slide, the graph on the left is looking at zip codes. And 22204, which is the zip code where probably 90% of Arlington Free Clinic's patients live, and most of those who are served by the safety net live in that 22204, looking at the number of cases in that zip code compared to any of the other zip codes is that you see where a lot of those vulnerable populations are. You also see on the other side, the, and this is a, a chart on deaths by age group, and look at as the ages go up, and particularly in the 80 plus, uh, population that that um, that is really basically showing you where the vulnerabilities are. That, as Dr. Varghese said, these are people who are at high risk for poor outcomes with COVID. They are not, um, you know, in the employee groups that that also are at risk because of exposure. But these are really this is my world from the free clinic. And in addition to these problems with COVID. Um, they also have a lot of other barriers which make it really difficult for them to reach. And it's very, very easy for them to get left behind when those of us who know how to use our computers and know how to check and they have access to word of mouth can quickly go on and get registered and you know find our place in line when the time comes. But so many of these individuals have uh, limited English fluency. They have 
very sometimes uh, no literacy at all, even in their own languages, uh, limited access to computers or smartphones or the, an inability to navigate that. That could be someone who's you know, 75 or 80 who's not used to uh, navigating the system or it may be someone who's just not used a computer throughout their life. Also, many of these, especially the older individuals and a lot of our patients have limited community, community mobility because of health conditions, because of age, or you know, for various other reasons. And so that's a barrier as well. And then there are also the things that you hear about the distrust of government, the vaccine hesitancy, the people that, you know, there are a lot of rumors that go around in these populations. And so uh, there are a lot of these barriers that we're working really uh, closely on. And um, I'm really proud of our work. We're in the, in the middle of, of filming a series of videos from our you know, staff as trusted sources on uh, letting people know that, you know, we've gotten the vaccine and, and you know, our, our doctors have and that they're, um, you know, had limited side effects. We're talking, doing FAQs in four different languages, as well as regular community updates on what's going on with the vaccine availability. Uh, we've also done a couple of pilots, initially a, a pilot with Virginia Hospital Center when they had uh, vaccine distributions to to learn what it was going to take for us to schedule our 75 and older patients uh, for the vaccine. And we learned a lot through that process. And then just last week, we were able to work really closely with DHS and um, the aging staff to get the rest of our 75 year and older patients registered. So all of that was by phone in with an interpreter or with a uh, Spanish fluent or another language fluent individual, and also with lots of very often lots of questions and sometimes using Metro access for transportation. And so there's, um, there are a lot of barriers there. And I just think it's really, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, but it's important for all of us to realize that there are people who are really in desperate need of the vaccine that as their time comes up are gonna need um, special care and, and special attention as well. And just a couple of things on how you can help and what you can do. First of all, if you fall into the green category on the slide, go ahead and get yourself registered. If you fall, fall in the orange, go ahead and get yourself pre-registered and wait until you're contacted to be um, uh, to schedule your, your appointment. I also ask you to just stay informed with accurate information. Share this link with others, share accurate information with others. Ask your organizations, your um, you know, your local coffee shop, your civic organization, your community organizations, your church to become partners. And you can do that through this link that you see here. And it again is gonna be on that main website. Help your friends and family pre-register for the vaccine or neighbors that might have trouble, you know, reach out and see if you can help on this because it's, it's very easy for some of us and it's very challenging for others. And in the meantime, Help us stop the spread of COVID. As Ruben was saying, it's like, keep wearing your mask. Uh, please continue to social distance. Please do all of the things that, that are important because as we've said earlier, uh, the vaccine will add one more layer of protection, but until we have a significant number of our, amount of our population vaccinated, we all are still gonna have to be very careful. So that's all I have right now, Hannah, and I will unshare my screen and turn things back to you and let you start the questions. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Verghese and Nancy, that was fantastic. Um, we have, looks like we've got about 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A, so they are rolling in. Um, so we're gonna get started. My first, I'm gonna ask, we have variations of kind of the same question, um, and I'm sure you know this one's coming, can you, Give us a little bit of looking into your crystal ball to tell us when you think uh, what you're anticipating in terms of the timelines for some of the rollouts. A lot of the questions are saying, you know, I'm in, I'm this age, I'm in this category. Uh, so I'm compiling that into one question. Do you have any general predictions? Happy to uh, try to give the best crystal ball. With I'm not a big speculator because it's always bad when you do that. However at the pace that we're currently receiving vaccine and we've invited over 15,000 people to get vaccine and we've roughly had about 10,000, 11,000 people actually receive vaccine in our own system. What we do is basically we invite a group, 
fill the slots. And then if we start seeing some tapering off, we invite more people so that we keep having the slots filled. So based on that, and someone that I saw it also asked about how many 75 year olds have we already done? That's harder to answer versus how many have we invited? We've actually, from the Virginia Hospital Center group that we had that had appointments, we uh, contacted 3,000 individuals to get them into the system. 2,000 of them actually took slots because they may have either not wanted it or had already found a uh, vaccine elsewhere. And then we invited, I think, another 5,000 the following week, if not more. Uh, Sorry, the numbers at the end of the day, I get a little bit um, uh, less certain of. So we're, we believe we're close to the end of the 75 category. We don't have to get completely done before we move to the next, but we have to make sure that um, we have enough vaccine. So I'm anticipating hopefully within a week that we will be able to move towards the 65 plus. The reason why I put the caveats, we have to make sure the vaccine actually gets delivered we have weather issues and so on. So that's some of the things that people have to realize if there are weather events, we won't be able to actually schedule things and we don't want to repeat what happened with the hospital. They weren't at fault in that larger sense, but anytime you have appointments and then have to cancel them, then we have to figure out how to reschedule and move things forward. That's why we're not actually putting uh, schedules together for weeks in advance because there's so much um, uncertainty, especially at this time of year. So we have been usually putting out schedules for about a week in advance. They fill up and then we put out the next week. So best crystal ball, the earliest would be uh, within a week. If I'm wrong and it's faster, I think you'll all be happy, but I'm just trying to manage expectations. Right. Um, I'll also share, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the Q&A, but I want to encourage everyone in Zoom to look in your chat box for the link, um, arlingtonva.us. It's the one that, the link that Nancy shared, um, and that's where you can get the um, up-to-date information. So take a look at that link and keep, keep checking in. Um, do you have any recommendations for the folks who are, I've had kind of variations of this question here, for folks who, um, are in the queue for the pre-registration, what should they be watching for? What, how do they know when they're gonna, when their turn comes up? Sure, great question. And I also saw someone asking possibly, is there a way to know when you're, where you are in the queue? That latter question, the county is thinking about how that could happen. That's not something that the public health division necessarily is our experts on. The county is putting all resources to think about how to get this done. Um, on the issue of, all right, you know, Remind me of the first part of the question. Yeah, around um, what people should be doing. Looking for, yes, sorry, okay. So when you get um, invited by us, what we do is the current system is we um, typically send you a uh, an email that says you'll be getting a notice from the uh, CDC as well as a scheduler from Arlington County to make the schedule. Do not do the... Uh, schedule in the CDC system because our clinic is not listed because we're trying to make sure it's either for Arlington residents or Arlington workers. When you open it up on the CDC system, anyone from anywhere can register, which we're trying to say that's not appropriate, which is why we have some limitations because we have to still use the CDC system. We've set, set up our own Eventbrite calendar. So you may want to also make sure that your settings don't reject things like Eventbrite. And um, I wish I had the email address right now, but we can send it to you so that you can send it to the folks listening to maybe make sure that that address is can be put, put into people's email systems so that it doesn't go to spam folders. But one of the things that we say, when your group is ready and we start inviting people in groups at a time in order, we want people to actually uh, check their uh, check those sites routinely. So great. I hope that helps. That's great. Nancy, is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, thank you. Uh, no, other than if there is someone who does not have an email address who's gone through the phone number manually, we're just telling our, our patients and ind individuals to, you know, if they get a 703-228 phone call to pick up the phone because people don't typically answer the f their cell phones unless they know who it is. And so those 228 numbers are something that we're starting to broadcast out so people 
um, are aware that somebody's reaching out to them. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna repeat that in case anyone missed it, 703-228. If you get a phone call from 703-228, then make sure to answer. Thanks, Nancy. And we did find a lot of our uh, patients did, our staff who was um, getting those emails did have to search their, their spam folders that mm. routinely that was a place. So it is, I think that's, that is a really important thing to do to go ahead and get that address in there or check your spam every day, which nobody's going to remember to do. So, Is that email address listed yeah. on the, the, that primary COVID, the link that you gave us for the COVID information page, landing page of all the things? Does it have that email address on there? I think it's an Eventbrite email, isn't it? There are two different ones. I wish I, I should have been better prepared and had those. I will have to send it to you afterwards. Although someone is watching from my team. So if they know, send me the, the link and I'll, I'll, I'll type it into the chat box. Or if you're able to tap it into your chat box, uh, that would be great as well. Perfect. Thank you. I know you've got a, I, I took a peek at the attendee list and you've got a lot of friends in the audience. So I'll send that over. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you. Uh, in terms of employees and frontline workers, can, Amy is asking about when employers will get information and related, related to pre-registering employees for phase 1C. Is that part of the conversation yet? So the system is, that we have is roughly the same system. Uh, well, it's the same system across Virginia. How each health department has it on their website is probably the big difference and also how which tools are being used so what we did first in 1a then in 1b as we identified employers we would contact employers in these areas and ask for a point of contact and ask them for lists of employees working in arlington so that uh, and if they had email addresses either from their workplace or their personal email so that we could then upload them in the system when it was their turn in the system so right now we've uh, currently been stuck at the child care uh, teacher level and everything before. But that doesn't mean we haven't been contacting the food and agricultural businesses in Arlington, the manufacturers, the grocery stores. So we're collecting those lists right now with the employers. And so we have that uh, space available on our website as well that they can actually look to see that outcome or survey that people have already put into the uh, chat box to be able to have their employer be contacted to say, all right, if you really fit into this category, please send us your point of contact and the names in this particular way. And then what happens is those names, when it's ready, they get uploaded. The CDC system will send them, there will be a link to the CDC system to fill out their medical information. We will send the Eventbrite uh, calendar, which is a type of scheduler, so that people can actually then schedule in our system. Unfortunately, sometimes there are more people invited, then there are slots. And we tell people, as you just reminded Hannah, to keep refreshing every couple of days to see are there new appointments. And they eventually come, but obviously there are people competing for this. Okay. Um, Alan is asking about, you know, if we, about if, if the dose shipments, if we start, you had mentioned, I think the number you said was 2,750 per week. Is that correct? Right. That right so, if hopefully that if that number increases, does Arlington have the infrastructure in place, including things like physical equipment for vaccination sites to be able to prop up and be ready for that? So it's a great question. So we actually have the infrastructure in place. Uh, it's been one of the things that the county has been quite generous about to be able to have enough vaccinators. And we partner with groups like Virginia Hospital Center and the free clinic, depending on what the needs are. We even have uh, relationships with uh, the nursing schools, including Marymount University, where we can use uh, nursing students to help in the process. That's all legal. Our emergency medical uh, services staff, the EMS crew can also vaccinate. So we are prepared to keep scaling up. The one problem that we have that's a little different than when we planned for H1N1 was um, we typically use school buildings for these things. And, you know, we're hoping that they will be back in session soon. So uh, we are looking at other spaces creatively. And the other piece that's a little different is six foot distances. H1N1, we didn't have that sort of requirement. And so we, we can't bring in lots of people 
and crowd them because we don't want our vaccine event to turn into a super spreader event. So we are looking at things. We've done a very good job at the Sequoia building on the campus borrowing space from uh, Arlington Public Schools. We're able to do the six foot distances, but we are you know, looking at other spaces, including places like Walter Reed. And it may depend on what the needs are at the moment. Some groups may need a particular space. The long-term goal is that the federal government and the state and we have is we want the vaccine to be in all the usual places that people get vaccinated doctor's offices, free clinics, healthcare centers, hospitals, and pharmacies, and the uh, health department. But it's gonna take several months before that's a reality. And so until that happens, it feels much safer to consolidate. And even though I've seen some people talk about the CVS program, we're not involved with the CVS program. That's a federal program. The Virginia Department of Health tried to get them to work with us as 35 health districts to coordinate the scheduling and that just wasn't something they were able to do. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't understand maybe why, but they're also doing it for 50 states. So it is it is a separate system and you have to keep refreshing for that one as well if you're 65 and older. Okay. Uh, Nancy is asking if there are any COVID variants in Arlington. And I'm actually gonna build on that question because I know I've heard this from other people, similar questions from others. I'm gonna ask about if you know about the, how the vaccine may predict from the variant, pr protect, excuse me, protect from the variants. So there are th three, uh, variants that people talk about, one from the United Kingdom, one from South Africa, and one from Brazil. So uh, all three have been detected in the US, at least two have been detected in um, the, uh, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, in, and including in Virginia. Northern Virginia has had at least two of the variant cases of the UK actually identified. And the CDC predicts that the UK variant is likely to become the dominant strain uh, by March across the US. So it's just a matter of time, not it's no longer if, but when. Um, having said that, what they believe based on the laboratory studies that they've done, they believe that the two mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna will be effective, not as effective as with the current strain, but at 95%, I can't tell you what the right percent is because we won't know until there's more experience, but I'm just using an example. If it's 85% or 70%, well, that's still effective compared to no vaccine at all. And so um, just like with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, it's currently uh, felt to be 85% effective. The different products will have different efficacies, but based on what the laboratory evidence from Pfizer and Moderna is they're reporting, they believe it'll still be effective. Uh, and we're gonna encourage people, whatever the variant is to get it because it's like anything else, more protection is better than not having that protection at all. Great. Um, Dr. Verghese, we had a wonderful one of our attendees, Linda, who received a vaccine schedule confirmation and she shared the email address that she received her vaccination from. If you wouldn't mind, could you just peek in that chat box and verify that that looks correct to you as well? I'd love to just hear it directly from you. Yes, that uh, my staff person said anything with the govdelivery.com is, our, so the govdelivery is what we are using because we didn't want it to um, uh, break our, email system. And the other one, the Eventbrite is, uh, looks correct as well. Perfect. Thank you. So I wouldn't, so I think we'd encourage everyone to take a look at that chat box in Zoom, take a look at those two emails and make sure to whitelist those in your email box. So you, so they don't go to spam. I think I just want to reiterate, Nancy, please correct me. I think earlier you said that you even had staff members who this went to their spam box, correct? Oh, that's right. Almost everybody's did. So it's, um, it's not, uh, it's not if it's probably, it's that it probably will. So it's a good thing to check, at least on Gmail. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We're getting some good tips here tonight straight from the sources. Um, so Sandra is asking, can federal workers who are Arlington residents and have continuity of government duties be registered as a group for vaccines by their federal employers? Great question. So the way we're doing it is if they, if you're a resident, you should register 
under the demographic group that you may qualify. If you are a resident and your job is in Arlington in one of those categories, have your employer do the registration, not you as an individual. So for, I'm gonna pick an agency, I'm gonna pretend, I know there's the, the FDIC building here in Arlington. So if you're a resident and who works at the FDIC building, FDIC should be pre-registering as an employer, but the county is also reaching out to the various agencies as they know to say, okay, who's your point of contact? Who are your lists and so on? This is the general agreement that DC, Maryland and Virginia have all come to agree to that. Each locality where the business is located is supposed to get vaccinated in the jurisdiction where that employer is. There are times when some people claim that they're not doing it and you know, we then contact our state health departments to say, can you work with that locality that's saying they're not doing it? And often it's because they've gotten the wrong information. So uh, if you're an Arlington resident, so we've had this example, Arlington residents who are teachers in Fairfax, they're supposed to get their vaccine through Fairfax uh, system versus in Arlington. And we've vaccinated Fairfax residents who are Arlington uh, public school teachers because they are part of our employer system. Great. So I had a question here from, oh, who said this? I'm sorry. Oh yes, Martha. She asked about how does someone volunteer to help at the vaccination clinic? So great question. And I will look for the email address, but you can be a medical reserve corps volunteer and um, you can find it on our website, which I will put in the chat box, but that is actually something, there's a whole process to uh, enroll, but we would love to have more people in um, uh, Arlington. Uh, our volunteers have been spectacular. We have them in significant leadership roles. Some of them we've ended up hiring because they've actually uh, don't have day jobs in a sense and have been really interested in continuing to help with this. So um, let me, I'm gonna click on the link and put it into the chat box. Um, so please. And you uh, don't have to be a medical person, yes. a medical professional to be an MRC volunteer. It's, you know, if you have a special language or if you're just checking in people or making phone calls and all, there's a lot of different roles that are not giving shots. So I put it in the panelist thing. I don't know if everyone can see that and if that needs to go to the question and answer block, but, uh, and yes, we don't, please don't, most of our folks are non-medical uh, and they have been critical to this, whether it's uh, flagging people within the clinic or helping out in the garage with parking and so on. Um, we love our reserve corps uh, volunteers. They have been phenomenal. Uh, so thank you, Arlingtonians. And we even have non-Arlingtonians who actually like our system. So um, we're very grateful for all of the people who are willing to help in this way. <coughs> that technique. I had a, I think this is probably going to be our last question for the evening. Um, I, I've had a couple comments from folks about challenges that they've had with the website. Can you talk to me about any technical issues that have gone on and any, you know, what people can anticipate in the future? I'm not sure what the issues may be, but obviously if, um, you know, the web team and our communications team is routinely looking to see in ways to make it as friendly as possible, realize this is a challenge, but as Nancy had mentioned earlier, for those who are having some technical difficulties, that there is the, uh, the vaccine uh, hotline, uh, the 7999 number. So it's 703-228-7999. If they can't find their answer, it's a way that they can look to see what's necessary. But most people have been able to find things on our website for, uh, for this. Okay, great, thank you. And just to double check, you said 703-228-7999? Correct, 7999, yes. All right, if anybody didn't write that down, I just put that in the chat box as well. So, oh, and I think um, 
All right, perfect. We put, I sent it out at the same time. We've got our person, our Scott in the background is doing it. So we're doing that. So a lot of these questions have been kind of very technical, kind of some technical and process to Dr. Verghese. Nancy, I just want to see if there's any, I'm sorry, I'm totally putting you on the spot here. So please push back if not, but is there anything you'd like to add just based on what we've reviewed today? Any calls to action you'd like to share with me? Or any just reflections as we went over, that we went over today? Well, I I, I think that throughout this whole COVID time, we've sort of, you know, pulled together as a community and we've all been through this together and we've worked through the different phases and we're in another phase and it's it's um, just like the other phases, it's not as smooth or predictable as we would have liked, but it's, uh, I think that uh, just from my perch at the, at the free clinic and then also at, as part of the committee, I've just been so impressed with the staff, the adaptability, the flexibility, and then the tenaciousness of continuing to work to get the processes right so people understand. And, and I, I will say that it will continue to get easier and more clear as we, as we know more. But I, um, I'm just, I'm really proud to be in this community to see the, the work that's going on. And I um, look forward to, to being part of that. So stay patient, stay informed, and help your neighbors out and uh, stay safe. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And that is a hopeful note to end on that we're going to see some, you know, it might be a tough moment now, but it's going to keep getting better. So if we're going to go ahead and conclude here, but if our attendees could stick with me for just a couple more minutes, um, I want to remind you all to register for our program next month. Again, it's how the pandemic has impacted student learning and well-being. The link is in the Zoom chat. We have been using that Zoom chat very heavily tonight. This has been a resource heavy evening. So take a look at that chat box. The program next week will be at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, March 10th. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you'll join us. We're going to talk about how students have been impacted over this past year and what APS is doing over is going to be doing to recover. Uh, I just want to really thank our speakers, Dr. Verghese and Nancy, for joining us tonight. These are some of the busiest people in Arlington now. So we are really grateful that they spent their evening with us tonight. This information was valuable. Um, if there was some information that was really important that you missed, I encourage you to go back, go to our Facebook page where this has been record, this has been streaming live and is gonna be, it will have a recording there as well. And I also would ask that you share it with people that you think need this information. I also just wanna thank everyone who's been tuning in and supporting the Committee of 100 over the past year. It's really been an honor for our board and will continue to be an honor to keep providing this content um, throughout the rest of the pandemic and after as well. Um, we, you know, it's been quite a year and we intend to get through this and uh, continue this critical information after. Finally, I just wanna thank our program committee. They really had the vision to put this program together, especially Patrick Hope and Jerry Laporte, our program committee co-chairs, and Scott Pedowitz, who coordinated the program. Also wanna shout out Brian Marikeen, who's doing a lot of logistics background. If you see me kind of looking around my computer screen, I'm, looking, I'm following some communications in the background that Brian and Scott are both helping me stay on track. So thank you for them. So again, recording is on the Facebook page. Please check that out. The link to that just went out in the chat to our Facebook page. Um, and you are gonna see an invitation coming out very soon for our next program. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again to our panelists and we will see you next month.